Hello, everybody. I'm Craig Johnson, and I'm a Minneapolis-based theater actor, director, and sometimes writer and teacher. And I came across an old PowerPoint talk that I gave many years ago on the origins and definitions and the purpose of theater. So I thought maybe I'd spend a little bit of time talking about that today and sharing that with you. So here we go. Let's do what the slide says. Now, so imagine, if you will, uh, maybe one of the most important events in your life, or if not in your life, maybe in your family's life, or just to imagine a really important moment that happens generally in people's lives. Now, it could be that the, the images that you're looking at would prompt you to think of weddings and funerals and other kind of religious services, and it may be that kind of ritual or ceremony as well. But just to sort of broaden that out, here's an example. My brother and his family often went to uh, Minnehaha Falls here in Minneapolis to have a family picture taken. And since I live pretty close by, I was often the photographer who went with them. And they did this annually for many, many years. So it became a family ritual or tradition that they did from when the kids were really young to much more recent times. So in any kind of event like that, one of the things that we do to try to make it more meaningful, to make it more special, is to add on different things to sort of lift it up and to give it resonance in our lives, to make it the milestone that we feel that it should be. So it could be that there's like a prop that comes in, maybe a piece of food, maybe it's on fire. And we know what we're supposed to do as the other participants in that. It could be that there's an action that's going to happen during that event. And we know what that means and it evokes certain feelings and gives us uh, a lot to think about. And sometimes even those just watching might respond to the event in a memorable way. Now, a lot of times these events have some kind of music going with them. Now, it might just be like percussion or drums or something like that, that, you know, just with the heavy beat might give us a, a sense of occasion and a sense of importance to that. But it might also involve other musical instruments playing in unison, playing in harmony, creating an atmosphere and a mood that again lifts us up. And there might even be someone who might be singing. And when they're singing, we know what they might be singing and we know how we're supposed to respond as well. And if we don't respond in the proper way, well, that creates a certain amount of tension and comment as well. And it isn't just a static event. A lot of times there's movement that happens. It might even be a dance and it could be a dance that's very ancient. It could be one from another tradition or it might be a movement that sort of has uh, gained exposure in our community and might represent something a little bit more recent from pop culture. Now the people who are involved in these different events might, we might not recognize them if we just happen to see them on the street, they might just pass right by them. But if they put on certain clothing, all of a sudden we know exactly who they are. We know what they're supposed to be doing and we know what our role might be as observers or maybe even as participants in some way. There might also be some food or drink that's involved in that special event. And if you change up the food and drink, well, <laughs> woe to you. And all of this might be in service of a certain story. It might be a very ancient story. It might be one we tell at certain times of the year or maybe every four years. It might even be one that we make the youngest among us actually go and tell the story. But it doesn't have to be a traditional or ancient story. It can also be one that relates to a group of people, even to a nation. And it's the kind of modern story that might happen again and again. And depending on what the story is, there might be a counter story, another narrative that will develop as part of it. Now, all of these things you're probably realizing are directly akin to the techniques of theater. So theater seems embedded in the most important times of our life. When we wanna lift something up to make it important, meaningful or resonant to us, we use a lot of the, uh, the tools of theater. And this goes back really until we're the very youngest ages, until we're babies. 
So look at these poor little kids right here too. Their minds are blown by this idea. As we little tots, we learn to talk. We have to learn to walk. We have to learn to dress, how to behave, how to interact with other people. And then as we become adults, we continue this in our home life, with our friends, in our workplace. There are often requirements for us and at school. So eventually we, we might realize, you know what? It's really all performance, isn't it? It's all just drag. And we start to realize that the terms of theater, mimicry, imitation, reenactment, infuse every part of our lives. So yeah, snap, it's all theater. Well, let's pause with that thought. You can just uh, dwell on that for a bit as we move into theater as an art form. Now, it's my belief that theater is an art and you might wonder, okay, well, what is an art? Well, we might say all of the different art forms. It's something that's created with a certain amount of creativity, with talent, and with a certain amount of technique or craft. And it creates something of beauty. Now, it might be a beautiful beauty. It might be uh, a silly beauty. It might be a dark beauty. It might be even be a cruel and ugly sort of beauty. But it's the kind of thing in the end that evokes and contains very deep feelings and important thoughts to us. I really like William Ball, who uh, was a theater director in his notes on directing, when he said that the greater the unity, the greater the art. So if you think about that, that means you, in theater terms, you know, if someone messes up the dance, well, the unity is kind of shattered right there. Or when somebody like Shakespeare writes in Julius Caesar, you know, the clock strikes, um, and you think like, come on, Shakespeare, they didn't have clocks in ancient Rome. Um, and that sort of shatters us a little bit. And theater is also something that reveals universe, meaning that it opens up new horizons, new vistas, and we leave the experience a slightly changed person. One of the other things I really like about theater is that all of the different art forms are poured into it. So you can just think about that, obviously music and dance that we've already talked about, but so many of the visual arts as well. There's a lot of painting, there's a lot of molding and sculpting, there's a, a lot of uh, designing and creation of costumes and all of the other different elements of theater. But it doesn't just stop there. If we drive down this definition of theater, we realize it's not only one of the arts, but it's one of the performing arts. And I just mentioned a couple of the others too. So if you have music, any kind of concert is a performing art, any kind of dance of course is, and there are a number of others. Theater is also an interpretive art. Now by that, we're contrasting that with a creative art, something like most of the visual arts, right? So a painter makes a painting or someone makes a sculpture or something. That is a creative act. Someone writes a novel. That is a creative act. Theater is largely, almost entirely, an interpretive art. So everyone is in service of the play and trying to bring that to life, all of the theater makers. So obviously, with the big exception being the writer herself or himself. So the writer, and of course that also means the, uh, the composer and the lyricist, are the creative artists in that process and everyone else is an interpretive artist. And of course, all of this is pointing to the other uh, kind of art that theater is, and that's it's a highly collaborative art. There are many, many people who are involved in theater. Just think when you go to the theater, you know, you have to, you're making your reservations online. Well, someone made that re website. Uh, then you go to the box office, you pick up those tickets. Someone's working there too. There's an usher. They give you a program. Well, someone made that program and you skim through it and you see all of those different designers and the show starts and you see like, wow, look at all of those performers up there. Look at the musicians in the pit, if it's a musical. And you realize it's probably someone up there in the booth who are calling things. And oh, look, the scenery is all changing. There are probably people backstage. All of those different people are involved in how we make theater. It's extremely labor intensive art form. So if we think about all of that, it starts to get a little confusing. So we might want to think, okay, what, let's just strip it all away. Let's just, what are the most essential elements of theater? And to my mind, I agree with what a lot of people have said. It's the four A's or the four Ps. You need a play, 
You need someone to perform it, the actors, musicians, dancers. You need someone to watch it, otherwise it's just a rehearsal. And it takes place somewhere. So in a theater of whatever sort. So the easy way to think about that, remember it, is the four A's or the four P's. Now, whenever I say this, there are always designer and tech friends of mine too who are up in arms about that. And I no mean, uh, mean to say uh, that we don't need uh, any of those elements. I'm just saying we can possibly imagine theater happening without a director like me. We can possibly imagine theater happening during the daylight. So maybe there aren't any lights and with the other design elements too. Now, I know there are also some of you, your minds are probably racing ahead and you're thinking like, oh, well, what about improv theater and stuff like that? And fine, fine, fine. You can go ahead and, uh, and, and pick at that if you want. If you say improv, yes, it's a form of theater, but there's always an idea. There's always the beginning of a story right there. Uh, but if you want to, you can say maybe that's one of the exceptions right there. So let's uh, sondheim this up just a little bit and put it all together and see if we can come up with a definition of theater. And to my mind, if we're working towards that, we want to include all these things that we just talked about. And so we could say it's a collaborative, interpretive performing art, right? We just talked about all of that, that reenacts real Hamilton hmm, or imagine, this is Illyria, my lady, <laughs> human behavior. So it's the reenactment of human behavior. And it's usually a narrative that involves some kind of conflict, some kind of change. And if it's a good play, it might be about something fairly big. Uh, so it contains some existential meaning. And it takes place before a group of people, it's live, it's live, it's live, in a designated space. Well, how the heck are we gonna remember that for the final exam? It's a bit unwieldy, I know. So here's another one that some folks have come up with. An alternative definition of theater is embodied storytelling. So if you think about it, you have story that contains our author, our play. The embodied is the central part of it. The actors have learned the story. It's their bodies, it's their presence, it's their hearts, their minds, their voices that are telling us the story and telling us includes the audience in terms of what is happening. So theater is embodied storytelling, whether it be Ben Platt singing away on a Broadway stage or the other picture, in case you didn't, hadn't figured it out, is the wonderful Maggie Smith holding one of General Gabler's pistols. She's playing Hedda Gabler in a production of Ibsen's play uh, from long ago at the National Theater, I believe, uh, directed by Ingmar Bergman, the Swedish director. Great picture, right? Well, this always gets us to that place where people start belly aching and we feel that weight of a broader society coming down upon us. It's just like, yeah, well, so what? Well, who cares about theater? Why does that matter? Give it a rest. But we say no. And a lot of times we get the voices from theater educators who might say mm, these kinds of things. Oh, sorry, some of those might be covered up right there. But the teamwork, the discipline, the deadlines, the problem solving, and all of those other things are the qualities that you learn when you make theater. And we've got to stand behind that those are good things for us to learn. And those are good practices as adults to maintain in any kind of situation that we might encounter in life. And then there are the other people who are the money people and they jump forward with the economics of theater. And they say, wait, 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 wait. No, let's just imagine the hypothetical couple. They're going to go to the theater. So they got to get a babysitter for the kids, right? And then they're going to take their car and they're, and they're going to use a, a parking ramp or something. So they got to pay for that too. They're going to go out to dinner beforehand. So that's going to cost some money. Oh, and then of course they bought their tickets. And afterwards, they're going to go out uh, for drinks with friends or something like that. So you can see theater contributes mightily to the overall social economy. And they're absolutely right in that too. But then you have the Oscar Wildeans who just get all up in arms and they say, why are we talking about money all the time? Why not the beauty, the joy, 
everything else, all the other qualities that theater brings, that art brings to us. We only need to focus on that. Well, great, so we've gotten to quite a hubbub once again. Let's take a look at another model for this. And it's one that was developed by Megan Lewis, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And I first heard this a, a number of years ago now. So um, I may have sort of uh, mashed this up with other thoughts that I have on it too. So apologies for that and acknowledgement to her original work in that. And Megan Lewis said, let's come up with seven metaphors. And these will illustrate the purpose of theater, the purpose of theater going and the purpose of theater making. And we can come up with these seven metaphors and they would be theater is a network, theater is an escape hatch, theater is a chalkboard, theater is a mirror, theater is a question mark, theater is a dream and theater is a hammer. Well, for goodness sake, what is she talking about? Here we go. All theater is a network. It's the gathering together of people in one place at one time for a shared experience. That can be said of a sports event. That can be said of a worship service. It could be said of school, any other uh, protest rally, something like that. All of these things are times when we gather together in live presence of one another in groups. And since I'm recording this during the COVID pandemic in uh, early 2021, uh, that it suddenly has greater and uh, more profound meaning than I had ever imagined before. But that sense of network, of community, relationship, and interconnectedness is intimately involved in theater. And we know that from the ancient and not so ancient, but classic moments in theater. So we think about Shakespeare's globe and the Elizabethan theater. When they stepped out on stage right there, not only were all of his plays involved in telling the story of all different strata of society, but he could look out and the other players could look out and the audience could look around at one another and see all of those different people gathered together in the same place, witnessing that same story. So theater draws us together in a network. Theater is often about networks as well. So many, many plays deal with the individual in society. Many plays also deal with uh, the relationship between family members. You see a picture right here of the five sisters for dancing at Lunasa, uh, Brian Friel's wonderful play that uh, that obviously is about their relationship and their interactions together. And a lot of times theater will even start to break down the audience and performer relationship like uh, Blue Man Group is a great example of that uh, where suddenly the performers, who's the performer and who's the audience member start to become blurred and it becomes one shared experience. So theater is a network, we acknowledge that. There's a story that when Andrew Lloyd Webber was um, uh, preparing the musical Cats, he sent the, uh, he sent the score, the kind of scratch recording or something off to Hal Prince and said, Hal, are you interested in directing my new show? Hal listened to it and they had a phone conversation afterwards. And, and Hal said, um, Andrew, I, you know, I don't, I don't quite understand this. Maybe I, I'm missing something like this is Grizabella supposed to be like Queen Victoria and maybe old Deuteronomy is uh, like uh, Prime Minister Gladstone and it, it, it represents all the different strata of British society. Is that what it's about? And there was a very long and awkward pause and Andrew Lloyd Webber said, Hal, it's about cats. Sometimes we go to theater just for entertainment. And whenever we go to theater, we always want some entertainment. We always want it to be some kind of show. It's a diversion. This is a leisure activity and we're spending our leisure time and our leisure dollars for a show. It's an opportunity for us to escape from our real world and get lost in another story. So it's not surprisingly things like musicals, laughing together at an uproarious comedy or getting engrossed in trying to figure out who done it. If you're watching Agatha Christie's The Mousetrap, no surprise that that has been playing in London decade after decade after decade. So theater is an escape hatch, a 
place for entertainment. But theater is also a chalkboard, particularly in a lot of the uh, regional theater in the United States, a lot of the nonprofit world has that aspect to it now for a lot of newer plays. Take, for example, uh, fairly new, um, August Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom that you see there. It's a chance for people to see their culture up on stage and to learn about it. And it's a chance for other people to see a different culture on stage and also learn about it. What, is the lives, what were the lives of black musicians like in the 1920s? And what were the larger issues surrounding that? But theater has long been used as a kind of chalkboard. The tr great tragedies of ancient Greece often were about the origin stories of that society, their relationship to one another, their relationship to other uh, cultures, and their relationship to the gods. So it had a strong sort of civic uh, engagement to it. And even something like Schoolhouse Rock, which is now a live musical that can be done where you can learn about how a bill becomes a law and stuff like that too. So we have uh, many, many examples of theater that is a chance to learn or to educate people about another culture. And I should add that it, a lot of times it's not about learning a, lot, learning a lot of facts about that other culture, but it might be to let people experience what it be, must be like to be someone in that situation, to be someone in a different world than we're a part of. Well, theater is also a mirror. In the musical, a chorus line, that became a truism when at the end of the show during one singular sensation, they're all dancing together in perfect unison and we're reminded that that's how we often experience the ensemble in a musical, the chorus, if you will, dancing away. So we don't care about the individuals at all, but we've just come through two hours of a chorus line where we've gotten to know all of their hopes and dreams and fears and we've gotten to know each and every one of them. So it has a profound impact on us as we reflect what does it mean in our work lives? Are we our job or are we a separate person? And that's magnified or reflected, if you will, when a huge mirror drops down behind that not only creates multiple images of the dancers, but also shows us in the reflection as well. And it can work in a different direction too. In another concept musical like Cabaret, in the cabaret and pre-Nazi, uh, early Nazi uh, Germany, the distorted mirror, this is from the, the film version with Joel Gray there, we see that we are distorted and bent out of shape, literally, as we watch this culture uh, dropping into the despotism that, and the Holocaust that was soon to follow. So theater is a mirror on our society and on other societies and allows us a chance to reflect upon that. Theater is also a question mark. And by that, we're getting into the realm of what uh, the great British director called holy theater. And that of course would include any religious plays and the roots of theater, which is in, uh, shares a lot in common with uh, religious practices. But even if we think about our sort of standard canon of plays, Probably the most famous line we have in all of dramatic literature is to be or not to be. That is the question. And I realize, of course, Benedict Cumberbatch right there is probably saying, alas, poor York, a different one, but you get the idea. On the other hand, even in some more recent musicals, Tevye can look up to the heavens and as he does throughout Fiddler on the Roof, have a conversation with God and say, would it spoil some vast eternal plan if I were a wealthy man? So questions big and small, existential ones about who we are, why are we on this planet? What will happen to us after we die? That is the stuff of theater as a question mark of revealing universe. Theater is also a dream. It's exactly like when we fall asleep and suddenly a strange new world appears before us. Like you see the magical island in Shakespeare's The Tempest. 
or it can be the stuff of nightmares of an unimaginable, terrifying world. This is from Jeffrey Hatcher's uh, wonderful uh, adaptation of Henry James's Turn of the Screw, which I was in a number of years ago. And it can also imagine and show us possibilities of new and different worlds, some of which we may have already read about, like Harry Potter. And finally, theater is a hammer. And as I said before, this is where a lot of the nonprofit uh, regional theater uh, in the United States particularly has found uh, strong voices. It's a place where, like a hammer, you can use theater to build something up, to tear something bad down, or to repair something that's broken. So theater can incite us to action, have us leave the theater and want to commit to a certain social change. And it can do that not only by just flinging its arms wide, but bringing an important message to us, like you see in the black and white photo at the top, Clifford Odette's Waiting for Lefty, a 1930s labor union play. In the one at the bottom, a uh, social satire, uh, Clybourne Park, about gentrification and race relations. And then the final one, one of our earliest and greatest comedies, Lysistrata from uh, Aristophanes which is of course an anti-war drama mixed with a sex farce and still a gangbuster play. So an example of theater being used for social change. So there we have it, Though those are our seven, oh, and I see that I might be covering up the, the seven right there. Sorry about that. So when we attend theater, when we make theater, it might be for uh, one reason, it might be for another reason, all the way maybe up to seven. So it's to be with others, to be community, to be entertained. And now I'm forgetting what the other two are <laughs> covered up right there. But you see down to five, to nourish our souls, to imagine, to make change. And I think we can see if we take a really great play, it might actually involve all seven of those different ideas. So Tony Kushner's Angels in America, a gay fantasia on national themes, I think I got that subtitle right, is an amazing play that came out in the uh, early 1990s about particularly gay men at during the AIDS crisis of that time period. It certainly was an opportunity for other gay people to see themselves represented on stage. So, so to see that community, it was also a chance for a broader community to imagine and see what their lives might be like at this critical time period. Of course, it was an entertaining play and I saw the original production and each half was three and a half hours long and we all as one leapt to our feet in applause at the end of each part. It is also something to nourish our souls because as you see, it's about angels who descend upon us. And the idea that it's in, it gives us a chance to imagine an unreal world, it is of course a play that is filled with all kinds of hallucinations, dreamlike, non-realistic kind of moments and fantasy sequences, sometimes terrifying and sometimes hilarious. And maybe overall, since it's Tony Kushner, if you know his work, it's a call to arms. It's uh, an opportunity to use theater to make change and to enact uh, social justice reform within our country. Well, there you have quite a bit about like what theater is used for right now, but you're still probably wondering how did it all begin? And the answer is, we just don't know. Uh, the only certainty is uncertainty. We do know that humans have always tried to explain their world through science, through reason or through art, through imagination and creativity. We also know that there's in our earliest societies that there's a deep connection between theater and religion. And probably rhythm and movement, i.e. dance and music, probably predated narrative theater. It just kind of stands to reason, I think. And theater probably needed to follow speech and a verbal communication and probably wouldn't get, have gotten started until a written word 
came along. So plays, stories could be passed down. So let's go with that, it's murky. Well, spitting out in front of us right here is kind of taking us back to where we began with the idea of myth and ritual. Now, if you think of a myth, not as something that's not true, but something that contains great truths, that's kind of like theater, isn't it? is often a story of a culture, of a, of a social group. It talks about their relationship, their place, their why they're here. It usually contains a lot of these, as I said, spiritual truths, core values that that society might have. Or if we look at through the lens of a journalist, it contains all of those who, what, where, when, why, and how kind of questions. And then the ritual usually is the action that develops to celebrate or to reenact that myth. And that's where theater and religion have these very common uh, origin stories amongst themselves. And so it's how the myth is then shaped, reenacted and lifted up. And maybe in a Christian uh, setting, that would be communion. And so all of those elements combined together form the practice of ritual and as we said at the beginning, it often is many of the same techniques that we use in the theater. But it can also be something that has a civic motivation. And it can be something that's really a contemporary retelling in a direct theatrical kind of form, like Jesus Christ Superstar. We do know that humans have always had a need to tell their story through art. And we have some of our earliest expressions are on cave walls and scratched in stones in petroglyphs of humans, of human identity, and in some places, maybe e even human art forms, maybe even the performing arts, where sometimes we see it looks like they might be dancing or playing music listening to music. It could even be that we see paintings where people are dressed up like animals. So they're reenacting in some kind of ritual or ceremonial form, some ancient rite of their culture. And since I'm writing from, or speaking rather from Minnesota, I'm reminded that in the Southwestern corner of our state is a wonderful place called Jeffers Petroglyphs where there are ancient uh, rock outcroppings that have been carved by the indigenous people that really that preceded the what we think of as the American Indian tribes or nations. And among those are images like this one that could be a bird, but people have said it might be someone who is actually reenacting a bird as some kind of uh, spiritual guide for that particular group of people. So telling the story through art and through performance art, we see that in our earliest expressions that we have of any kind of human civilization. And where we're coming closer to theater is in ancient Egypt, where a lot of the funeral processions and the origin stories of their gods were enacted through large ceremonial kind of pageants, maybe not exactly theater in terms of the narrative that we're thinking about, but there seems to be costumes and actions and many of the things we associate with that. And so once again, we see religion and theater with national origin stories kind of sitting side by side together. But by the time we get to uh, the written word, then we're coming into an area that's really close to theater as we know it. And that starts with the oral traditions recited you know, with a, a storyteller and an audience. There might be some movement or there might be some music and as written language came into being, these followed and there are a few little scraps of them from stone tablets and papyrus. As we had said, maybe our earliest expression might have been some of the hieroglyphics from Egypt in North Africa. Then we have the Epic of Gilgamesh in Mesopotamia that came along. Many of the Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures also from the Middle East, obviously from Judea. 
would tell the stories of their people and were probably originally oral traditions, eventually written down. And by the time we migrate, if you will, over to ancient Greece, we have the great narrative sagas, poems really, uh, ascribed to the poet Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And by that point, we're having stories being performed, but we have yet to have anyone step out and actually do the embodied storytelling. But that's where theater, we believe, commonly begins. And that would be with the theater of the ancient Greeks, particularly in Athens in the fifth century BCE. And that's probably a good place for us to pause on the origins and the basics of theater, along with some of its essential elements, all of its different purposes. And I just want to thank you for watching along here today. Here are some pictures of me from my checkered career as an actor. Thank you so much. I'm Craig Johnson, and hopefully I'll see you next time.